I hope that that's what we do this morning. I hope we look upon the Lord. That's what we came here to do. If you would uh, pull out your Bibles with me and uh, turn to 1 Chronicles. We're going to start off in kind of an odd place for an Easter Sunday. 1 Chronicles in the Old Testament. I'll give you a second to get there. 1 Chronicles chapter 17. Like I told you at the beginning of the service, we're starting a new series today called Greater Than Yourself. And today's uh, message is that God is simply greater. We can't go to the next three weeks until we establish the fact that God is simply greater. Over the next few weeks, uh, we're going to talk about the fact that God is greater than my kingdom. God is greater than the kingdoms we build. God is greater than our addictions, our sins, amen? And God is greater than our fears and our doubts and our anxieties. And, and so we're going to go there. But we need to establish that God is greater. God is simply greater. And isn't that the, the big cross, crossroads that everyone, I, I think, must pass through at some point in life where we have to decide if we really believe that God is greater than us? Psalm 115, verse 3 says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that He pleases. See, God's sovereign. God's holy. God's the creator. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He is the sustenance of everything. Amen. God made you. God made me. He is totally in control. But like I said, let's, let's start in this kind of odd place, I think. I've never, I've never preached this passage uh, on Easter before. In fact, I don't even know if I've ever preached this passage. I've used it in Bible studies before. I don't know that I've ever preached it on a Sunday morning. I don't want to go and look at the life of King David. And I want you to see where the prophet Nathan goes to David. God's told Nathan to go to David and to tell David something. 1 Chronicles 17, I think we'll probably have it on the screen. 1 Chronicles 17, 7 through 10 says, Now therefore, thus shall you say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep, to be prince over my people. So look at what he's saying. Nathan is telling David that God said, Look where I've taken you. At one time you were tending sheep in the pasture, but now you're the king of Israel. Look at where you are. And verse 8 says this. It says, And I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place and, not, and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall waste them no more as formerly, for the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will subdue all your enemies. Moreover, I declare to you that the Lord will build you a house. Now quickly, we don't have a whole lot of time this morning. But to get into the context, chapter 17 of 1 Chronicles opens with this scene of David giving the prophet Nathan a tour of his palace. Probably a whole lot better tour than Graceland. Anybody ever been to Graceland? I was a little bit disappointed. That green room's pretty cool. But other than that, I was like, man, I can't believe I paid this much to walk through this. But as they walk through the magnificent halls, I could imagine that they step out on a balcony, and kind of get it in your mind's eye, they step out on a balcony that overlooks the city, and there in a clearing just outside the gate, there's this modest one-room tent. Now, what is the tent? The tent is the tabernacle that had to be constructed to be the place where the Ark of the Covenant was placed. In Old Testament times, before the coming of Christ, before the life of Christ, before Christ died, lived and died on a cross and rose again, the presence of God was in the Ark of the Covenant. The, 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 Jesus said there would, the Holy Spirit would come. The Holy Spirit, if you're a believer, the Holy Spirit lives in your soul. God's presence is in you, and you know that. But in the Old Testament, it was actually, in, it sounds crazy, but it was in a box, and, and they took care of it, and they honored it. And it was placed in the tent, in the tabernacle. This was, this was before, the, uh, before, the, before, the, um, before they had built the temple. And so God's presence is dwelling in a tent. Get this in your mind's eye. But David is living in a palace. Can you imagine being David as the full realization hits him that the presence of God is in a tent, yet he lives in a palace? And I don't know exactly what transpired but I could imagine as Nathan reminds David of what God has done for him, that maybe David turns to Nathan and he asks, 
Nathan, how did this all come about for me? How did I ever get to this place? I was a shepherd boy. And now I live in a palace while the presence of God of Israel is out in a tent in a pasture. How, Nathan? Why? So realize that David had come a long way. It was a long way back to his early teens when he was tending sheep in Jesse's field and he was a puny, weak, younger brother that nobody ever thought would be chosen to be the king. The head and the armor of the giant Goliath had been collecting dust for decades by now in Israel's treasury. And faded, I believe, were the memories of the hatred and the jealousy by a king named Saul about David becoming king. And now from the outside looking in, if anybody were to look at him, David had arrived. He had climbed the ladder one difficult rung at a time. That's what David had done. But if you read other passages in the Old Testament, you see that King David had a deeply ingrained truth burned into the fabric of his being. Now, King David wasn't perfect. King David sinned with Bathsheba. King David made all kinds of mistakes. But he had this ingrained truth burned into the fabric of his being. And it's the very truth that I hope we will realize this morning. My hope is that over and over throughout the next month, throughout this series, that this one simple truth will be ingrained in us. And that simple truth is this. If you want to write down one thing, write this down today. Put it on your phone. Tweet it out. Whatever you're going to do. But walk away knowing this. God is simply greater. God is simply greater. For whatever reason you're here this morning, know this. At every turn, God is simply greater. He is greater than us. That's why I'm calling this series Greater than yourself. Every time we start to think that we are self-sufficient, every time we become self-serving, every time that we think we're able to make it on our own, when we think that we have it all figured out, when we think that we know what's best, when we think we can live how we want to live, do what we want, that we can ignore God's Word, that we don't need God, that things will just work out in the end, or that we can just ignore God and what He's telling us, that when we decide that this right here doesn't count then we need to remember that we are nothing without God. That we are totally dependent on God. And He is not, get this, and He is not dependent on us at all. I remember watching the movie Remember the Titans, and the team kind of had this come-together meeting in the mid-season. Those of you that have seen this movie, you'll remember this. And one of the captains of the team told the players, Look, we ain't nothing, y'all. We won a few games, but so what? We ain't nothing. Let me just establish this as we go into this series. We ain't nothing without God. He is everything. Life is about Him. We were created for Him. You may not know it, but you were created for God. Without Christ, we are hopeless. Without Christ, we die in sin and we go to hell. We are dependent on God for the very next breath that we breathe. People try to leave God out of life, but it never works. It never has and it never will. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let me ask you this morning, what are you doing with Jesus right now? Do you know Him? Do you know your Creator? Listen to David in another passage. You don't have to turn there. It'll, it'll be on the screen. 2 Samuel 22, verses 2, and 2 through 4. It says, The Lord is my rock and my fortress, and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield, and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, and my refuge, my Savior. You save me from violence. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. You see, David realized that as great and as powerful and as blessed as he may have seemed to be, that God always has been and always will be greater. That if we ever think that life is all about us, then guess what? We just think wrong. We were created for God, by God, for His purposes and not our own. And going back to this point where David and Nathan are talking, I think David realized that as blessed as he was, that it was only temporary. And it was only given to him so that he might in turn glorify God. He realized that he should always desire, and we should too, that he should always desire to put God on display. Boy, shouldn't that be our desire? When you and I really get connected to the Lord, to the kingdom of God, 
and to the cause of Christ, we'll have a similar experience just as David did. We'll stand in agreement with things like he wrote in, in, in Psalm 145, where he said in Psalm 145, verses 10 through 15, he said, All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom's an everlasting kingdom, amen? amen? And your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all His words and kind in all His works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up those who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food in due season. Listen, I'm learning more and more these days that life is so little about me and so little about my desires and so little about my liberties so little about my spiritual position, but it's all about His position in me. He's the King of my heart, Lord of my life, owner of my stuff, purpose of my ministry, reason for my existence. David realized that his success wasn't about his kingdom at all, but it was totally about God's kingdom. He realized that life never was and never would be about what he had, but about what God had given him to use for the furtherance of God's purpose. You see, the point today is that if you don't see that life is about something and someone bigger than yourself, that if you don't see that life is all about Jesus and that if you don't know Jesus, you're missing the point of life, if you don't see that God made you for Him, not for you, then you haven't understood what life is all about. Now, let's ask the big question. Because we all know that's right. What does that have to do with Easter? What in the world does any of that have to do with Easter? Well, if we all face the reality that we are created beings, that God created us, and that we are the ones who turned on our Creator by sinning against Him, didn't we? That with our sin, we cut off fellowship with God. That because of our sin, we deserve death. That's what the Bible says. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. We deserve death, but despite our sin, here's what's awesome. God never quit loving us. And He came to our rescue when He could have said, forget them. He could have taken this position. He could have said, I created them and they turned on me. But instead, God the Son, Jesus, came to earth. He left heaven and came to earth, lived as we do, died on a cross. God died. You get that? God died. God gave His life. It wasn't taken. Nobody takes God's life. He let it be taken. He laid it down. But then because He is fully God, the wrath poured out on the Son, but because He's God, he was put in a tomb, but he rose three days later. He conquered something that no man could have ever conquered. Only a sovereign God would have laid down his life for humanity. And only a sovereign God could raise again from the dead. He's the author of life and death. Death and life. He invented them both, didn't he? And that's what it has to do with Easter. Jesus Sovereign God of the universe did it all for us. I just want to say this morning, Jesus is God. He claimed to be the great I Am. In response to the Pharisees in John 8, 58, Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I Am. Jesus is the great I am. Of, of all the extraordinary claims that were ever made, none was as shocking and as revolutionary as this claim that was made by Jesus Christ. I mean, he made all kind of claims. He, 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 he claimed to have divine authority. He claimed to have power to cast out demons and perform miracles and even to forgive sins. He said about himself, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. I'm the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness. I'm the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will never die. But right here, in John 8, 58, he just outright says, I am God. Jesus says to the Pharisees, you dishonor me, but I'm God. I came to rescue sinners. 
I left heaven to rescue the lost who believe. I'm not here to be honored by you. If I wanted honor and glory, I would have stayed where I was in heaven. You know, Jesus had glory with the Father even before the world was created. The opening words of John's Gospel are this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. The, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, existed from all eternity. If He was interested in His own glory, He would have stayed where He was and said He steps down from heaven and becomes a man. Jesus didn't come to receive glory for Himself. He came down to serve and to suffer humiliation and abuse and to save sinners. He came to be spit on, mocked, and killed for us. And more than that, He came to have the wrath of God poured out on Him. So He wasn't seeking honor. He was seeking to save the lost. What, what He means is that there's no one who... Who is behind him secure there's that there was another behind him securing his reputation and his honor, and Jesus submitted to the plan of the Father in that. That God would be glorified, and that's how Jesus is glorified, because he went to the cross. You see, here's the point. It's on Calvary's hill, the cross of Christ, listen to me, church, where we most see the love and majesty and power of God. Christ doesn't need our honor. He didn't come seeking it. He doesn't need us. He loves us. But you and I need to honor Christ, don't we? Because if we don't, the consequences are horrible because the Bible says that God is just and God will judge. There were these people, like I mentioned earlier, that Jesus dealt with called the Pharisees. They did not honor the Son, so they couldn't honor the Father. They sought their own glory, the Scripture says. They were trapped and they didn't realize it. They were honoring themselves. They lived for their own desires. Let's put it in modern day terms. They did church. They played the game. Oh, they said they knew God. But the Pharisees were self-righteous people. They were blind to their own sin. They were blind to sin's power to capture and to enslave so that even when Jesus pointed out their problem, they had blinders on. They could not see it. If you have blinders on this morning, I urge you, do everything you can to get them off and to see that God's calling you. That Jesus is here. Let me ask you this morning, what about you? Do you fall into the trap of the Pharisees? Do you clamor after praise and admiration from other people? So that what you do, what you say, is just to look good in the eyes of other people rather than bringing glory to God. Let me just tell you, tell me, tell you that you were created to bring glory to God. Who do you live for? Do you live for you? Or do you live for your Creator and Savior? Paul reminds us in Colossians that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. The writer of Hebrews says the Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful Word. Jesus claimed to be the great I Am, which in Hebrew is the word Yahweh, the name translated to Jehovah, translated in most of our modern English translated Translations as the all capitalized word Lord. Jesus is Lord. It's the name God used when he first revealed himself as the one who would rescue Israel from bondage in Egypt. Jesus was claiming to be God, Savior of the world. It's what Isaiah had prophesied. He said, I am the Lord, your Holy One, Israel's Creator, your King. I am the Lord, your God, who upholds your right hand. I am he who blots out your transgressions and remembers your sins no more. That's who Jesus is. Jesus said, I'm the first and the last, and there's no God besides me. Listen to me real close on Easter Day 2015. We won't ever have this day again, will we? Everything in history is being unfolded providentially so that the promise of redemption may be fulfilled through the Son of God. That's the only way by which someone can be saved. You see, the Lord has broken into time and the history to redeem a people for Himself. The great I Am 
has come in humility to bear the sin of his people and to die the death that we deserve. And he did die that death. He said, it is finished. And because he is God, he rose on the third day. And he prepares a place in eternity for those who believe. No one else, only those who are saved and redeemed by him will spend eternity with him. Are you saved and redeemed by the Son of God? If not, you will not go to heaven when you breathe your last breath on this earth, but you will be condemned to eternal hell, separated from God. Your job won't matter then, your hobbies won't matter so forth, so on. What will matter is where you stand with God. Are you His? Let's don't play games on Easter. Let's proclaim the truth of Jesus Christ. Are you His? It'd be a shame to dress up and come to Easter and walk out the doors and not know Jesus Christ. If that's all you've done, you've just dressed up and come in the doors for Easter. Do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Have you come to the point where you realize that He is greater? Jesus calls us to avoid the trap of the Pharisees and to see who He really is. He calls us to follow Him because of who He is and because of what He's done for us. A.W. Tozer once observed that people treat Jesus in much the same way the British treat the monarchs. The kings and queens of Britain are called the rulers of the nation, but they do not actually rule, do they? They only reign. They do not have any power. They are mere figureheads whom people bow down to and address as your majesty. They take up a lot of attention, but the British people do not allow these kings and queens to have any practical power in their lives. It's the kind of indifference that our culture shows toward Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, it has spilled into the church. Maybe it's always been there. But listen real close. My Jesus is not a mere figurehead. He's the only one who has the right to rule, the right to control our affairs. When we see him claiming to be the one who honors the Father by the way he lives, the one who removes the sting of death from those who follow him, the one who is the intimate of God, and the object of all his plans and purposes of all times and all ages, and finally the one who is himself above all things, the eternal one breaking into time wherever he chooses and however he chooses, then we face the reality that we will either worship him or we will ignore him. Are you a Christ worshiper? If not, then you've chosen to worship yourself. You've chosen that you're greater than Him. That somehow you think your way's better, but it won't ever work. If that's you, that's the way you end up. He'll say, depart from me. I never knew you. But if you know Him, oh, it's going to be so much different, isn't it? It's what life's about. God is simply greater. We are not. His death might have seemed like defeat, but his resurrection proved that he is God. No man could keep him down. We must acknowledge him for who he is, the great I am. Life has always been about Jesus Christ, hasn't it? He is simply greater. In fact, I'll say this morning, he's the greatest. There'll never be another who's greater. It is finished. Life hangs in the balance with understanding who Jesus is and with knowing him. Could I pray over us? Father, this morning... Lord, I pray that we would see that you are sovereign. Lord, that you are king. Lord, that you are the author of salvation. That you are greater. Lord, that you're the greatest. Lord, I pray that you would pour out salvation, Lord, for anyone in this room that is not saved. Lord, that they would come running to the foot of the cross. Lord, that they would see their need. They would realize their need. And Lord, that out of your sovereignty, Lord, that you would call them and save them. Lord, in fact, this morning, let me just pray this, Lord, if there's anyone that's seeking you and they know it's their time, they know it's time to call upon you, I pray they would just simply call on you and say, Dear Lord Jesus, 
I'm lost. And I need to be saved. I want to know you, Lord. Would you forgive me of my sin? And Lord, would you wash me clean? Would you save me? I'm broken and dirty, Lord. Would you wash me whiter than snow and save me? Would you... I'm giving my life to you, Lord. My life is yours. And on Easter Sunday, 2015, I'm trusting, Lord, that you are saving me, that you are my Savior. And Lord, I pray for believers in this place, Lord, that we would get real about our faith. God, that we would come back to our first love. we would never forget the power the saving power Lord that you brought into our lives that changed us Lord that we would not be flippant about our faith but God we would be real God strengthen your church fill us with integrity and the right things let us be Christ worshipers Lord, as we close out this service, as we sing a couple of songs, Lord, would you just move in this place, whatever people need to do. If they need to come and pray, need somebody to talk to, we're here. Lord, we're just going to close worshiping you. Let it be a sweet sound in your ear. God, I pray all this in Christ's name. Amen. Church, would you stand with us? We're going to sing. If you need to come and pray, do that. If you want someone to talk to, we're here to talk with you, okay?